Hey, welcome. We are here again, and we are going to go ahead and review a book entitled The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Reese. And today we have our brother Chris. Hey, Chris. How you doing? Good. How are you guys doing? Great, great. Thanks for being here. Um, well, we talked about this book in the past. I think the three of us have talked about it uh, in different situations. And um, I know for myself, it was a book that dad brought to us, or brought to me. And at different times in my life, I didn't know this, but I looked at in an old box of books and I see that I had a couple of copies. And I realized, oh, dad gave this book to me a couple of times. <laughs> and I guess he really thought it would be a good idea for me to read it. Is that similar to you guys where he just gave it to you or um, how did that work? Yeah, he definitely gave it to me. He gave me a couple of copies for you too also, by the way. <laughs> and as give many a... copies as possible. Never saw a copy. I had to purchase my own copy. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> you know, dad, sometimes if you go, you know, go through it, as we know, we go through his things. Uh, he has a bunch of books for a different, you know, a couple of different topics. But this was one of his favorites, I think. Hey, Jake, what's in the red cup? Oh, agua. And it says simplify. No, that's not the red solo cup. The red, red solo cup. I thought Where's you it? had a red solo cup. Sorry. No, not Go today. On. Not today, Ruben. Today I'm, I'm mm -hmm. all chipper. No, um, so looking at this book, uh, and it's a very small book, right, Ruben? Can you show us the book cover? Because you have it. I have it on my uh, Kindle. There you go. Maybe pick it up a little bit. There you go. The Four Agreements. And so this is a book, thank you, by Don Miguel Reese, that um, it goes through these four agreements that you have with yourself or people have with themselves regarding um, just to better their lives. He would say probably to live a life of freedom, peace, and love. Um, I felt like, and you guys can correct me if, if you feel differently, I felt the, the beginning of the book especially is very spiritual. And not that it's uh, uh, like Christianity. I feel like it's a mixture of different, uh, it's like a new age feel, new age feel. Do you guys get that as well, that sense uh, with, the, with the book? At least the beginning piece? He started it, it seemed like he started it and ended it that way. Yeah. Um, much more on the spiritual side uh, and the new age side. I felt like he ended it well though. Yeah. Um, uh, clearer for me at least, but but definitely way out there as far as those kinds of topics. Not way out there in a negative way, but way out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, it, it is way out there for um, some parts mm. to, in a negative way. I, I, really? I, I, w I would say that um, uh, on the surface. However, I say that with a little asterisk or caveat because <clears throat> mm. there's a part that's in the first agreement where he says, it, it's, you need a great deal of courage to challenge your own beliefs. Because if, even if we know we didn't choose all these beliefs, it's also true that we agreed to all of them. So um, there's a, I think the intro talks about you are God. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, med it's a little bit too medicine man for me, uh, typically, yeah. where it challenges me and I, I would normally put this book aside when I, whenever I, like 15 years ago, I wouldn't have even gone past that page. But I'm always trying to challenge myself and push my own beliefs and strengthen them. And it's okay to read something I might not agree with everything, or at least challenge why I don't believe it and to push myself a little bit. So I was open to reading it. Yeah, I, I'm glad you share that because I think once you pass that beginning piece, um, for some people, not for everybody, but for like for myself, and I think you, you share the same thing, Ruben, that you get to the four agreements, what the, the nitty gritty of this book is really all about. And then we could do that. Let's, let's talk about these four agreements. Let's look at the first one. And it's be impeccable with your words. Um, uh, Chris, what, what does that mean to you? And, and, and did that ring true to you in any way or um, in your own life? Yeah, it's funny because um, I was just talking to one of our cousins I'll, um, I won't mention which one by name, but his initials are David. Uh, and uh, 
he was telling me how he was just missing my dad and just different things that he was thinking about. And uh, so I was telling him I was accidentally here at his house. I didn't mean to be here. I obviously messed up and we we're going to have this. Uh, I thought we were going to do something else. But I was, he was telling me how he would call my dad uh, late at night and different, different chats with him and how he could always, you know, just have a good chat with my dad. And then I said, you know, Dave, my dad never talked about other people. My dad never gossiped. He, we never could get any information of, of my dad. He would always just say, so-and-so is doing great. So-and-so is doing So one part, there's a, that's a huge chapter as far, not, not in length of words, not in length of, of what he, um, length in time, huge, more about huge as in the impact that can have on a person's life impact on what he was trying to to communicate and so i would say that one part one small part of that first chapter was not to gossip you know and he says gossip is black magic i think that's one of his exact yeah. words <laughs> he yeah. does not back on gossip and so um bringing it back to just your 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 word and it being impeccable i just to me, I hate gossip, but I just look at my life and I go, man, I was not and am not like a good example like my dad. He just, you know, um, he didn't do that. So just happened to have that conversation uh, in the last few minutes, uh, waiting for you guys, uh, thinking, man, that is that is a good way to live your life. Um, so talk about, uh, what, what did you think about the black magic part of it? Because he, he gets deep in yeah, he goes into it, like you said, uh, he even goes into like saying, you know, it's like a computer, he, he wants it, he gives a visual, like it's, just, well, maybe a visual for computer geeks. Uh, it's like a computer virus, right? Where viruses just destroy everything. I mean, right now my wife is dealing with a, a virus in her computer and it's frustrating and it gets you angry, it gets you upset. And that's what these words do, right? And if you're gossiping, you're basically po setting your poison and it's, it hit one person. Now that person's going to send their poison to another person. And, and then and now all of a sudden you're poisoning a whole community and it could even get larger. Right. And we see that in politics and we see that, you know, if you read books, sometimes you read books, like let's say in the 1960s and things that were going on, you find out, Oh, that really didn't happen. What? I mean, it was such a, it was a story that everyone believed. No, it was just hearsay. You know, and even, even though old Hollywood lore stories, a lot of them are just false because people just like, you know, gossip even though it, it really destroyed a lot of people's lives. <clears throat> How about you, Rube? Yes, uh, he talks about the power, if you live by this agreement, how it kind of supersedes all the other agreements and that um, it even has the power to put you in heaven while everyone else is in hell. So if, if you think about the idea of, of being impeccable with your word, you're not only being impeccable with others, but you're being impeccable with yourself. And um, there's, a, there's a line in the Brothers Karamazov where he said, there, uh, one of the characters tells another, a very wise character says, the biggest lie in the world is the lie to yourself. So I think there's a lot of truth to that because once you lie to yourself, then you're capable of anything because you believe you could believe in anything because you've lied, you know? So I think that impeccability with your word is also true to yourself. And he goes into details about how you should accept yourself, love yourself. And I know that's controversial with some people. How can you love yourself? But I think it's important to love yourself um, in order to love others. Respect I, yourself too. Yeah. It, it doesn't mean that you're going to put yourself on the throne and, you know, Lord of, or, over others, but you're going to respect yourself. And so I think it's, it is a, it's, it's a good chapter. I do want, yeah, it is. And I, I do want to say something regarding teaching because I, I, I try to watch, uh, read this book with, in the lens as a teacher and it, it, dad gave me this book again, like for probably the third time uh, a couple of years, no, about four years ago. And um, it really helped me out a lot, quite a bit. in this one area uh, with a student I had about four years ago, he, um, a student at, and his mother asked to have an appointment with me and the principal and the district employee, I'm district uh, representative. All these people got into a room and I'm like, I didn't know what it was all about. And the student and I were actually very close, I thought, and, and we were. 
And basically the bottom line of the, uh, the meeting was that I said something and it hurt his feelings. And I said, well, what did I say? And, and he shared that it was, a, it was a day. He even said it was a stressful day for everybody. It was a stressful day for you, Mr. Aguilar. But uh, I brought up, like I was behind in, in, in uh, an assignment. And you said, what am I supposed to do with it? What am I supposed to do? How, you know, why is that affecting me? You know, that's your issue. And so I said, wow. I said, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. And I thought about it. I go, as teachers, we can really do a lot of damage. Even though I didn't think at the time that was a big issue. Uh, but it did hurt his feelings, and uh, and he just was crushed. Maybe part of it was because we did have a good relationship. And I think we, as teachers, uh, have to remember that uh, we're we're on the we're on we're on the stage all the time, and they're watching and they're listening. And uh, I have students from the past who come back and tell me things I said. I go, I don't remember saying any of that stuff. <laughs> but it's but they do. They remember every word. So I'm, not sure I'm going to put listening. myself. I'm going to put myself on the firing line here on this uh -oh. point, um, put myself under scrutiny. Okay. I used to do this thing um, where I used to make promises to students. I used to say, I'm going to get you this. If you're good, I'm going to get you that. I used to make these promises. And then, um, first of all, you shouldn't make that kind of a promise anyway. You shouldn't make that kind of negotiation anyway. But um, assuming you do, you should fulfill it. And I would not fulfill some of these. And um, I have a, a, a hazy memory of a, of a student calling me out on that. And, and it, he might not have, or she might not have, not have but I, or I might have called myself out and I realized, man, um, I stopped doing that. But, but, I've, but I've done that. And students recall that. And they, may, and they, re, they remember those promises. And it's, it's, not, it's not a wise person who, who doesn't fulfill his word. So obvious, I know that's an obvious thing, but just don't make a promise. Even if you don't, even if you're not going to give it, it's okay. It's better not to give it or make the promise. And, and who, who doesn't like a surprise anyway? You just, just give something to people randomly if you have to do it. Very good. Well, that, even Purpose. on that note, probably, probably Jake deals with this also with his kids. Cause I know I deal with it. My kids is small, or large promises, like you're saying, Ruben, any kind of promise. If, if you plan on saying something to someone like, I'm going to give you A, then probably is best, don't say it, just do it. Uh, because they do remember those things. And um, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. I believe it's, it's a promise, is that right? Yeah. So I'm constantly trying to remind myself and I constantly am telling my kids that because I constantly, I think I do that all the time too. So we have to be very careful not to do that. Very good. Wow. Convicting here. Uh, the second agreement. Don't hey, take, be, go before ahead. you go into the second agreement, I got to ask, can I ask one question? Why it looks so good to it's you? Pro, it's the previous chapter that's not in the agreements. Oh yeah, go ahead. I, I, I'm not even trying to weigh in. I'm, I, I'd be curious to what Chris thinks. But I'm really curious about what, how you would answer this. I kind of think I know how Chris would answer it. Oh. But here's the statement they make. They make a really – he makes a claim here that would be very hard for some people to make, and he kind of buttresses the whole book on this claim. Okay. So here's the claim, and I want you to react, Jake. And then Chris can too, but here it is. As children – so before I even say this, to me, Jake, I think of you as somebody with, with a lot of opinions – both spiritually and politically. I mean, obviously, Chris does too, spiritually. But more you, Jake, politically. Spiritually, would you say that you have opinions spiritually and opinions politically? Would you, would you say that's fair? Yes, sir. Yes. So here's his claim. As children, we didn't have the opportunity to choose our beliefs, but we agreed with the information that was passed to us. We never had the opportunity to choose what to believe or what not to believe. We never chose even the smallest of these agreements. So my question to you is, do you agree with that? That your beliefs are not yours, that they were, that you were, it was handed to you? Oh, that's, that's such a good question. Great question, Ruben. Because I'm going to tell you why it's a great question. Because I have dealt with that several times in my life, thinking about that question. And I would have to say this, two-parter, if that's okay. First-parter, I would have to agree that um, 
you know, politically and um, spiritually very much influenced by my mother and, and somewhat my father too in, in some of those ways. Uh, and so wherever she went, I think definitely I went. <clears throat> there is a time in your life though uh, where you have to ask that, those questions to yourself where you're at as an adult. And I think for me, it was later as an adult, not as a young adult. And I had to come to grips with, is that my, are those my political leanings? Are those my spiritual leanings? And I, and I felt good with saying, yeah, I believe so. Uh, now, is it really a choice? I, I would say in the beginning, I would say it wasn't a choice. Uh, so I'm not sure if, if that's a cop out, but I would say as a young person, no, I, I didn't have, I don't feel like I had a choice, but later on I chose. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. I, I, okay. No, I'm just, just wanted your answer. Okay. That makes mm -hmm. sense. What you're saying. Any comment, Chris? Um, I would say the older I get, I'm just more and more open to know mm -hmm. that I'm probably wrong on most of this. So why have an opinion? If someone asks me in a quiet moment and I really believe that they're asking me, then I might tell them what I really believe about, let's say a political thing, which is very going to be very hard for me to talk about in an open way. So they have to really convince me that they want to know. On the spiritual stuff, I'll, I'll share, but I, I'm open to being wrong on most of this stuff because I feel like I find out I'm wrong on a lot of things. It could be a, a specific scripture or even a big belief that I had. I had. I, mean, I can get up a list of things that I totally realize I'm wrong on. So what do you, on your end, Ruben, what do you think? I wholeheartedly agree with him. And I have to accept this even as an adult. I have to say, I was handed these beliefs. So what does it, what do I do with that? I know this, this kind, kind of sounds controversial, maybe to some people, but for me, what it forces me to do is just to try to be a little bit more humble on how I approach people because they might have something. And the fact that I'm reading this book and agreeing with, with much of it um, tells me, okay, that I've, I've made some progress. Some people would think, I'm, I'm regressing, but it's not about having to agree with every minute point. It's about hum being humble to, to embrace a book that was given to us out of love and to uh, appreciate these points, many of these points that are very wise yeah. and that have existed for thousands of years for a reason. It's the Lindy effect. Things that last <laughs> are there for, they've lasted for a reason. So, I, just say, I, look, I, I, th I think um, the, of the three of us, I've, and I think that's why dad gave me a, a couple of copies because I'm the more stubborn one. And I think he was trying to get through, <laughs> through to me, you know, and it finally was open just a few years ago. Like that's what I said as an older adult that I was open to say, wait a minute, I don't know it all. I, I, I mean, I need to, like you said, be humble to, to learn and to say, wait a minute, my beliefs or my thoughts isn't held by everybody. And who to say that, who's to say that mine are superior, you know? So uh, I think I was finally at a place where I could listen. And I finally, I finally was able to listen to, uh, to this book and to, to really put it and in, in, in be part of me. So, wow. Okay. Uh, the second agreement, don't take anything personally. Uh, Chris, uh, how did that, uh, how did, what do you make of that one, that chapter? I I think the biggest thing is how can you not? This is a, this is the first agreement is the most important, as he says, but the second one is really difficult mm. uh, to not take things. We, mm. we are all, I'll, I'll, I'll just say myself, I am constantly personalizing everything that happens around me, everything. It could be things as big as COVID. How could this not be personal to me? or small things that, you know, uh, one of you guys is, and I are working on together. We are just constantly taking things personal. So to take a step back and not take things personal and to realize that that other person or that other situation is on a course of its own, in, on, in its own little simulation or its own little universe, dealing with its own track, as hardly anything or nothing to do with you. Actually, I think the book is pretty clear, nothing to do with you. 
has absolutely nothing to do with you. It is pretty freeing and uh, probably the chapter that gives me the most peace. The uh, first one being the hardest probably to do, but the second one saying, man, if you could live without taking things personal, um, I think people think, by the way, if you know me, that I don't take, take things personal, but no, I do. I just internalize it, but I'm practicing not to take things personal has been very good for me personally, just to let it go. Let that person deal with whatever they're dealing with and I move on. This is the quintessential teaching chapter because if you think um, a student pushing back on you is personal, then then you need to read this chapter because um, it's not most most of the time. You know, um, I would say most of the time. The um, this is about. Uh, looking at a student, where they're at, assessing them. And then the last, the last resort is, is it me? Maybe I'm to do with this. And, uh, but maybe it's the student, maybe, it, you know, and so uh, I would probably call myself out on this as well, because um, I think when I started teaching, I was really uh, emotionally uh, open, easily wounded by little slights, it still happens though. It's still a struggle and I'm really trying to check myself, but he mentions this, when you take things personally, then you feel offended and your reaction is to defend your beliefs and create conflicts. So we never wanna think that about ourselves, that we're the ones creating conflicts. It's always the other guy, but um, automatically, if you don't take it personally, and you think there's some objective truth here, some objective reality as to why this is happening, then you can look at it with more wisdom and not emotional. And when you're emotional, you create these conflicts. And so um, if we don't get to it, because he brings this up a lot and he's right on point, the way to push back on that is to ask questions. If you keep asking questions, then you it's hard to get angry and emotional if you're asking questions. There's a humility involved with it. So, yeah. Maybe it's, it's great. Are you saying, are you asking questions or the other person is asking questions? You are asking questions. Okay. Um, when um, somebody feel, when you feel offended, when you feel the, the, the onset of a, being offended, it's like, oh, did I, did, did I say something? Did, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, did I, could I have said something different? And then, um, oh, okay, you know, the, the idea of that is, can really off, you know, can really knock off at the head this idea of offense. Yeah. Well, that, that, that quote of seeking to understand rather than to be understood is, I think, it, 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 it narrows it down to if you're asking questions, then you really do want to understand. But that's, that's probably the key is, do you really want to understand? Are your questions to understand or to be understood? And so if you, if you ask questions really to try to seek that person out, try to understand where they're coming from, uh, it, it brings peace into your heart and most likely will bring peace into that relationship. Yeah. It, he states that sometimes people send their poison at you, um, but it's really your decision to take it or not. It's your decision to accept that or not um, and to internalize it. And sometimes we have to um, not take things personally about how we feel about ourselves because he talks about that. He says, you know, sometimes we're, we say things or we internalize things about ourselves that aren't true, you know, and it's, it might be because of the time period you're in, you're in a, in a difficult situation, uh, you're maybe stressed at work or whatever it is, and you, and you start believing some of the things that you tell yourself. And he goes, no, 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 don't, don't believe that either. Um, and I think... Um, that is difficult. When you say this is the most difficult one, Chris, I think that that's where I look at it. I go, wow, not only am I thinking about other people and, and you know, kind of filtering it and also thinking about, hey, um, what are they? They must be going through a tough time if they're saying something. Because I think he shares that too, right? He says, hey, you don't know where they're, where they're coming from. And they may have had a tough day or may they have you know, a situation that um, you're not aware of. And then you're internalizing things that they're saying and it's not coming from a place of health or or he might even say a good spiritual place, right? So um, what do you think about that? Well, just paste, like, peace. 
yeah. a place of saying, I want to have a peaceful life. I want, and that person probably wants that also. Yeah. Um, just being a person of peace and a place of peace, creating that. But if everything is about you and about how you have been slighted or how they must have meant A, B, and C instead of looking out for you or whatever it is that you're going through, mm -hmm. um, then you're taking on all these assumptions yeah. and that's not people for, for them or for yourself. Well, I think that, that leads us to the next chapter. Don't make assumptions, right? Um, so, uh, with this, uh, Ruben, what, uh, stood out with you on don't making assumptions for the third, um, agreement? Yes. Well, here's where he emphasized questions, asking questions. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and if you think about it, um, this is a way to really become a smart person and a wise person is you don't know. So you keep asking. You don't assume. Um, and how do you feel when somebody cuts you off in a conversation and says, oh, I don't want to mention names, but the two of us know somebody like this. When the camera goes off, uh, you'll both laugh when I say the name, um, who will interrupt and will say something. And you want to say, that's not at all what I meant. No, because they seem to already know it all. And they know your train of thought. And it's like, you, you don't feel understood. You don't feel respected. But then I have to ask myself, don't I do that? Don't I make assumptions? And um, the, the fallback is uh, make sure the communication is clear. If you don't understand, if you don't understand, ask. Have the courage to ask questions until you are as clear as you can be. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a great chapter as well. And uh, it's very I think they're cousins to the last one uh, yeah. because it involves they humility. They are. How about you, Chris? Well, I think also the, the assumption that the other person, we shouldn't assume where they're coming from, but we should also not assume that they know where we're coming from. So for sure, asking the questions, but then also reassuring the other person. So in a, in a, in a close relationship to tell that person, Hey, I know this is difficult or I know we're at odds. I love you. I care about you. I, I, I want you to understand me. I, I'm not doing a good job. Clearly I'm not doing a good job because clearly we're at odds right now when we're not, not normally at odds. So really seeking that person out with questions, but then also assuming that they don't know, especially if their defenses are up, right? I mean, if their defenses are up, then there's something wrong, right? So we should assume they don't know we should, you know, we, we shouldn't make that assumption that they're, they're on the right place with you. Um, so I like to, to, I've been working at this particular one also where, where I'm uh, asking the questions, like Ruben mentioned, and then assuming that they don't know where I'm coming from and assuring them, hey, this is where I'm coming from. I want to help you or I want to be at peace with you. I love you, you know, like giving them that reassurance. So that there's that that foundation constantly being laid, not not easy, obviously. It's all about the communication. I mean, I think he he used this also uh, probably a good chapter for a married couples or or even dating people who are dating to read because when you get into a relationship or even in marriage, you have sometimes you come in with assumptions, right? Well, this person's going to do this, they're going to do this, and when they don't do it, because I know of a of a couple where this um, let's say one of them. Why no? One of them was, was assuming the other one would make dinner every night, right? And that wasn't happening. Like, wait a minute. I, why aren't you doing that? Like, I, we never had that conversation. Or how about make it bigger? How about children? I didn't want children. You, did you think I want, you know? So you have to have some conversations uh, before that. And, and I think he would say that too, to, to be clear, to continue to, to talk to one another. And you're saying that too, Chris, right now. Um, just, and you're doing it in love. And it doesn't have to be somebody who you're um, maybe upset with, but somebody you really care about. And you really want to make sure clarity is always there, right? So um, he, he would say that we, we many times create emotional poison for ourselves by just doing that assumptions, right? Having those assumptions. Um, so I will uh, say, I will say yeah. briefly as a teacher that um, I've been in yeah. a class where the teacher has support staff around them and they just go with their lesson plan without ever talking to the staff. And that mm -hmm. is a real 
piece that is really disrespectful because sure. the staff is not sure how to help the kid. And all it takes sometimes is five minutes to sit with the staff and say, this is what I'm doing today. This is what you can do to support them. You can ask me if you ever get, I always do that every day because I've seen it not done. And I've been a recipient of that. Um, how am I going to help this kid? I don't know what this. So don't make assumptions. Um, Even with kids, Ruben, I mean, I know for me, there've been times where like for usually the first day of school or second day of school, I see a couple of kids, I go, Oh, this, might, this kid's going to get in trouble or, uh, and then they end up not. And then, or I, I feel guilty by making that judgment already by assuming just by the way they dress or by the way they walk or by the way they uh, address me in the first day. I'm like, what? And uh, then everybody had that bad feeling without saying, wait sure. a minute. You know? But uh, at, at I, least there's no victims there. Yeah. But if, you know, except if you, if, except maybe your own, <laughs> evil thoughts yeah anyway all right. all right so finally um the last one which is a little different because the first three were like kind of like don't not kind of they are and the last one is always do your best um what do you think about that chris always do your best well that's a good one because we're <laughs> we're constantly Especially, I think, you know, I've, I've been reading different kind of books lately um, in regards to some business stuff that I'm working on. And, it, you know, we're on this hamster wheel. And um, in the last two or three months, I'd say a couple months, I've definitely taken like a, um, I'm trying to take stock of where I'm at. And um, you, you start to say, well, what is your best? What is, you know, how do I do my best? Um, and what does that even mean? You know, um, does that mean working nonstop? Does that mean, um, so you, you just, I think if you take a big step back in, out of your normal mode, and this is a great time of year, by the way, that we could do this. I'm going to, I'm going to in, invite my kids and uh, Veronica and her kids to do this with me, which is to start thinking about our new year's resolutions to stay, take stock of what it is that we should be working on so that we do our very best. So as an example, for me, I personally am working on my relationships um, to do my very utmost with the relationships, especially the closest ones around me, doing my very best that, that, you know, I think doing your best sounds like, you know, doing your best at work. Yeah, that's true. But if you can't have your relationships, if you're not doing your best at home, um, at, in, in this case for you guys teaching, then how are you going to do your best? If you're not doing great at home, how are you going to do your best at work? Um, so really just taking stock of your whole life and doing your utmost at all of it, because then you can, I think, I don't know, lay your head at night and, and uh, feel better about it. Yes, I, uh, I agree. Um, and I mentioned a couple of weeks ago. I don't back, know if my Zoom is on or off or what's going oh, on. on. We hear you. See you. We can see you. Yeah. Um, a couple of things I would say to that is this is truly to me the legacy of our dad because he did things with excellence. He worked hard. Um, he, has, he has people, many hundreds, if not thousands of people that would corroborate that. But also there's a point in the, in the chapter where he says, doing your best is taking the action because you love it, not because you're expecting a reward. Most people do exactly the opposite. They only take action when they expect a reward and they don't enjoy the action. And that's the reason why they don't do their best. It's just the, the love of the teaching of the, I can't wait till they read that. I can't wait till they perform this task. And it's feeling great about it because that's the prism in which we do this podcast as teachers. But of course, anything, anything you do. Um, that's why a lot of people have gotten off that hamster wheel that Chris has indicated earlier of just the nine to five, uh, because you're really doing things for somebody and making them money as opposed to what are you doing for yourself that makes you feel rewarded uh, it's not just money. It's just something that you enjoy that you, you've been called to. And so for some people, it's, it's teaching others, it's business, but um, it's that reward of the work. 
as opposed to the weekends, he was talking about people just living for the weekends, which is a, a kind of a waste of time and not reward enough. Two days out of the week. But by the way, if I can jump back in there, you know, um, mentioning my dad again, and the last uh, few months, I, I'm guessing you guys have mentioned what's happened with my dad. So yeah. the, la the last few weeks, this has been plaguing my mind lately, not, not in a negative way, just over and over again, I've been thinking about reading this book. You know, we decided to read this a couple of weeks ago and I read it every year on my birthday, which has been a couple of weeks ago. So um, I read it a couple of times this time. And what hit me this time was that this guy in his last week of his life, within seven days, and he was very sick in his last seven days, he was working, he was doing his best, and he was therefore making our lives easier. I mean, he was definitely difficult in some ways because he was very sick, but he would, uh, we all had different jobs and what we were doing for him. And man, that guy was working hard. He was working hard at giving us our marching orders and what we had to get done, uh, which was going to make our lives easier, interestingly enough. But, but even physically, he was working hard to make life for himself and us and the people around him uh, easier. And it's not so difficult. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I look back now and I wish he would relax more, but I think he, he did do his relaxing. He, he did it his way. I don't know. He did it his way and we must do it our way. So he was doing his very best. I really believe that even though I might do it different, uh, he, I must once again, take stock and say, what am I going to be working on and then uh, do my darndest to do it. So just another thought. He, uh, I, I mean, I did that's good because I, I was thinking the same thing in a different way that throughout, you know, even years ago, not even the last two weeks or month or whatever, it, you know, it was difficult in those, the last few weeks. But when we were younger, at least, and I know all three of us got this where I would say, dad, I'm doing my best. I'm trying. No, no. What can you do better? What can you do different? I mean, why aren't you, you know, cause I would say, I can't, it's too hard. You know, I would say it's too hard. And he would say, no, 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 um, Jake, it, it, um, you decided it's too hard, but it, what else can you do? And so I think he, he knew I wasn't doing my best. And it would come to a place where I'm like, well, I could do this. Like, you know, I always could figure some else. And then, or he would say, you could figure, you, you could figure this out. Right. And uh, I think he was always up, uh, encouraging us, he, not only to the end, but even as our, our, as we were growing up to do our best. And um, I think that's a great legacy of him. And uh, I mean, even looking at the book, I think Reese would say, you know, uh, uh, those first three agreements, you know what, uh, they grow if you're doing your best. If you're, if, if those are happening, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to help you do your best because uh, if they're not, that's probably an indication that you're not doing your best. If, if those three, you're not having victory in, you're not doing well in. Um, and so I think it's true. Um, and um, I think that looking at these four agreements, uh, don't taking things personally, having your words impeccable, don't make assumptions, always doing your best. I think that's a great guy to uh, live, like he would say, live a life of peace, freedom, um, and encouragement. Um, before we go, any last words, you guys? I'm read good. It. Great. Yeah, read it. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. On Amazon, you can get this book for about five bucks, shipped nice. to you for free if you have Prime. And I found out if you go to Barnes & Noble, you can pay 12 So five <laughs> really? to you. Uh, or, or if you see uh, me, uh, I'll give you one for free, but um, you got to come see me. But I get them on Amazon for five bucks. I give them away. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you, Chris. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.